Now it's time to take a look at the difference between physical properties and changes and chemical properties and changes. A physical change is one that you can observe without changing what the substance is, only its appearance. And a chemical change is one you can only observe by forcing the substance to undergo a change in identity. For example, if you take two elements and combine them together to form a compound, you've changed the identity of the substances you're working with. You originally had elements that were separate from each other. You ended up with a compound. That is a chemical change. Same thing goes in reverse. If you take a compound and you can decompose it back into its original elements, again, you're changing the identity of the substances involved. That is a chemical change. If you take a compound and dissolve it in water to make a solution, like salt into water, you still have the same substance. The only difference is before it was solid, and now it's just mixed in with water. That's all you're really doing is mixing it with water when you're dissolving it. Because the identity of the substance doesn't change, that's considered a physical change. The same can be said for phase changes. When you change a substance's phase, you're not changing the identity of the substance. All you're doing is changing how far apart the particles of that substance are from each other. In the solid phase, the particles are packed close together in a crystal lattice. In the liquid phase, the molecules are just simply further apart and free to move around. Since you have the same substance, it's considered a physical change. Whether you're talking about solid to liquid, melting, or gas to solid, which is called deposition. They are both examples of physical changes because you're not changing the identity of the substance, only the distance between the particles of that substance. Chemical reactions involve changing the identity of the substance. For example, in the chemical reaction combustion, also known as burning, a fuel such as methane is reacted with oxygen in the atmosphere to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor plus enough heat to get any unburned fuel to glow. In incomplete combustion, not all of the fuel burns, and the unburned fuel is heated by the heat of the reaction. And we see that hot unburned fuel in the form of a flame. A flame is just particles of soot or smoke that are so hot that they glow. If you have a gas stove at home, you'll notice that the flame is blue because your stove is calibrated to exactly burn off all of the fuel so that there's no unburned fuel that can glow and cause an orange flame. So a clean flame is going to be blue or completely colorless. In fact, it won't even look like a flame at all. Anyway, back to the point here. Because you're changing the identity of your substance, you don't have the same substances as reactants as you have as products, this is considered a chemical change. The same can be said for this next reaction. Certain metals, called active metals, are very susceptible to being eaten away or dissolved by acids. Acids are substances that contain hydrogen ions dissolved in water. This is sulfuric acid, a very strong acid. Anyway, when zinc reacts with sulfuric acid, the zinc takes the hydrogen's place and becomes zinc sulfate. And the hydrogens are released as gaseous hydrogen. You see what's happening here? Here the hydrogen was bound to sulfate in a compound. On the other side, the hydrogen has been set free. Because the identity of the substances has changed, this is also a chemical change. Gas to liquid. Does this look familiar? It should. You have exactly the same substances on both sides. The only difference is that they're different phases. This is a physical change. Finally, when you talk about rusting or corrosion or oxidation, what you're talking about is the reaction of a metal, an unprotected exposed metal, to the oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, most, most metals are going to undergo oxidative corrosion. Iron turns into rust, for example. 
That's why you're not seeing chunks of iron at the surface of the planet, because as soon as iron is exposed to air, it will oxidize and turn into rust. Some metals are going to do this a lot faster than others. For example, sodium will oxidize almost instantly, very violently reacting with the oxygen to form an oxide. That's why when you get metals, all the metals that you see, aluminum, iron, the only exception is really copper, silver, gold, platinum. You can find them pure. But most other metals have been hanging around for about four and a half billion years, reacting with the oxygen in the atmosphere. So over all that time, the metals have corroded. And so in the, in the planet, you have what are called metal ores. For example, iron oxide, also known as hematite, is a common iron ore. If you want to get iron out of it, you have to decompose the iron ore through a series of steps. And that's where we get our metals from. Every metal that you see, every metal that you used, started its life in the ground as generally an oxide formula. Now, because we have two elements and we end up forming a compound, we've changed the identity of our substances. This is a chemical change. Now, what about some other changes? For example, we said before that metals can conduct electricity. Well, in order to test to see if it conducts electricity, you don't actually have to change what the substance is. You can just test its conductivity. That's physical. The same thing goes if you want to flatten out a metal or shape it in any way. If you flatten it or draw it out into a wire, all you're doing is changing its shape. And if all you're doing is changing its shape, you're not changing its identity. It's still going to be the same element it was. So any shape or size change is physical. When I accidentally broke this piece of silicon this morning, it was originally one solid disk. When I broke it, proving that metalloids are brittle, that was again a physical change because I still have silicon. It's just not a nice circle like I had this morning and I'm really, really sad about that. Sulfur is generally found as a crystal. You can find it on the surface. If you go to a place like Yellowstone, you see a lot of this yellow stone sitting around all over the place. That yellow stone is sulfur, which is why they call the place Yellowstone, and it smells so bad, although it's beautiful, glorious to go visit. To get sulfur into a powder, you have to take the crystals and crush them because sulfur is brittle. When you crush sulfur to form powder, that, again, is physical. Because you're not changing the fact you have sulfur, you're just changing the size of the particles. And that's the difference between physical and chemical.